For nearly half a century, the moon was nothing more than a memory. Since the end of the Apollo missions and the disappearance of the Luna program, no human trace had been left there. No new samples had returned to Earth. Our satellite became a familiar yet forgotten backdrop, hanging in the sky as a silent witness to what humanity had once accomplished. Little by little, we stopped looking at it. We believed we had understood everything there was to understand. And yet, that silence was only an illusion. While public attention shifted toward Mars or Jupiter, something was happening behind the scene. Space budgets began to shift, new players emerged, and the first detailed maps revealed areas that had never been explored before. One question eventually imposed itself. Why, after so many years of indifference, were major nations redirecting their efforts toward the moon? Today, we know that this return is no accident. Beneath the gray dust in the frozen polar craters and even deep within the far side lie resources, materials, geological clues, and perhaps even energetic opportunities capable of reshaping our future. And at the heart of this rediscovery stands one actor that has crossed a threshold no one had ever reached before, China. In 2019, when China landed on the far side of the moon for the first time in history, scientists around the world understood that a new era had begun. Since then, data has poured in, sometimes clear, sometimes enigmatic. Some images have revealed unexpected materials. Other observations were released with delays, fueling questions and speculation. It is no longer simply a matter of exploring the moon. It is a matter of understanding it, using it, and perhaps sharing it. Because behind the Chang'e missions, Artemis, the ambitions of SpaceX, Roscosmos, ESA, or India, the first great geopolitical rivalry of the 21st century in space is taking shape. And this rivalry already has a battlefield, a gray, dusty, silent one, the moon. As the years go by, it becomes clear that this massive return to the moon is no coincidence. It fits into a geological, technological, and strategic logic that goes far beyond prestige. The moon is no longer a mere symbol of conquest. For scientists, it is an intact archive of the history of the solar system. For engineers, an ideal site to develop large-scale autonomous technologies. And for governments, a territory rich in resources and strategic positions whose value is only now being fully recognized. It is in this context that China's lunar program unfolds, a series of missions structured like a battle plan. Chang'e 1 and Chang'e 2 in the early 2000s prepared the ground by mapping the surface with unprecedented precision. The data revealed unique geological features, unexpected mineral traces, and above all, the first hints of a resource that may become the key energy source of the coming century, helium-3. This rare isotope, almost absent on Earth, has accumulated in the lunar soil for billions of years under the influence of the solar wind. No other celestial body accessible with current technology is believed to contain such quantities. And in a world where the search for clean, stable, and near-infinite energy has become vital, this discovery profoundly reshapes how nations view the future of space. When China performed a soft landing in 2013 and deployed its first rover, U-2, it was a confirmation. It now mastered every stage of an autonomous lunar program. But the true turning point came in 2019, when Chang'e 4 became the first spacecraft to land on the far side of the moon. This region, invisible from Earth, is one of the most mysterious places in the solar system. 
No direct radio signal can reach it. No mission had ever landed there, and its topography is radically different. To overcome the communication barrier, China first positioned the Kuekiao satellite at the L2 point, more than 60,000 kilometers behind the moon. At that precise point, gravitational forces balance to keep the relay in a stable position, able to see both the far side and Earth simultaneously. It was a precise, almost surgical piece of engineering, one that opened a technological breach into a domain no one had managed to tackle before. When the U-22 rover rolled out of the lander and began exploring the von Karman crater, it found itself literally in untouched territory. The surface was older, scarred, darker. The lava plains of the near side were gone. In their place stretched fractured regions, overlapping craters, geological layers frozen since the time when Earth itself was still a molten world. This exploration finally allowed scientists to address one of the moon's great mysteries. Why do its two hemispheres differ so drastically in composition and geological history? The rover's instruments recorded unprecedented mineralogical data. They analyzed fragments of melted breccia, a glassy material born of the extreme heat of ancient impacts. They detected anomalies in the distribution of certain metals and confirmed the richness of helium-3 in the local soil. But beyond scientific data, this region also revealed images that left a lasting impression. In 2019, U-22 detected a bright, unusual patch at the bottom of a small crater. Ground teams immediately noticed its strangeness. The delayed release of the images sparked waves of speculation worldwide. When China finally published the photos, the substance appeared dark, glossy, almost like natural glass forged by the violence of an impact. But the Chinese program goes beyond geology. On board Chang'e 4, a tiny biosphere experiment was deployed. Inside it, cotton seeds germinated and the first plants ever to grow on another world. Though the sprout did not survive the freezing lunar night, the experiment provided the first concrete proof that extraterrestrial plant growth is possible with proper thermal protection. Philosophically, the image carried immense symbolic weight. It showed that a form of Earth life could bloom, even briefly, under an alien sky. In an instant, it transformed a hostile environment into a place where one could imagine, almost touch, the idea of a human future beyond Earth. Behind these anecdotes, a deeper shift is taking place. All these missions are turning the moon into a major zone of strategic interest. The presence of water ice in the permanently shadowed craters of the South Pole represents a key resource for future bases. Water can be used for consumption, agriculture, but above all for producing hydrogen and oxygen. Propellants capable of fueling spacecraft. The moon could become a refueling station a logistical hub enabling cheaper access to Mars and beyond. The polar regions, especially areas in permanent sunlight, are becoming essential sites for installing solar panels and stable habitats. And these areas are rare, making them all the more coveted. In this context, the ambitions of various nations collide. China announces plans for an international lunar research station by 2030. The United States, through Artemis, aims for a sustainable human presence in the same region. Europe, Russia, India, and Japan are developing their own programs, sometimes in collaboration, sometimes in competition. And above all looms a thorny legal question. Can lunar resources be exploited, and if so, by whom? 
the 1967 Outer Space Treaty forbids territorial sovereignty over the moon, but says nothing specific about resource extraction. This legal vacuum now fuels an increasingly heated international debate. Some see an opportunity, others a risk. For without a clear framework, equity and stability become hard to guarantee. As scientific challenges multiply, political stakes grow more visible. We are entering a new phase of space history. Mission after mission, China brings back rocks, analyzes samples, explores craters, and maps regions that science had previously known only through blurred outlines. Chang'e 5 returned in 2020 with the youngest lunar rocks ever collected, two billion years old. Chang'e 6 in 2024 brought back the first samples from the far side, offering an unprecedented look at the deep composition of this long hidden hemisphere. The upcoming Chang'e 7 and Chang'e 8 missions, scheduled for the late 2020s, aim to explore the South Pole, search for ice, and test technologies for constructing a future autonomous lunar base, perhaps even 3D printed from local regolith. Meanwhile, the Artemis program is developing its modules, rockets, landers, and commercial partnerships to establish a sustained American presence at the South Pole. Both projects may converge on the same regions, sometimes separated by only a few kilometers. One can already imagine habitats illuminated along the rims of eternally dark craters, radio antennas scanning the deep cosmos, robots drilling ice for extraction, while major powers watch one another's progress with keen attention. In this light, the moon becomes a mirror, a mirror of our ambitions, our rivalries, but also our future possibilities. Today, the far side of the moon is no longer an unknown land. It has become a geological laboratory, an observation post, an exploration ground, and perhaps a strategic outpost. It is also the symbol of a question that has followed humanity from the beginning. How far are we willing to go to understand our place in the universe? As missions succeed one another, one truth emerges. The lunar race is back. But this time it is no longer about planting a flag or collecting a few rocks. This time it concerns our energy future our ability to survive beyond Earth, our capacity to collaborate or confront one another in an environment where the rules have yet to be written. It concerns our entire civilization. The moon, long silent, is revealing itself once again.